Hey humans, how's it going? Susan Ruth here. Thanks for listening to another episode of Hey Human Podcast. This is episode 348, and I had a conversation with Alex Robkin. Alex is back on the show to talk about his sobriety from heroin. He and I had a conversation back in 2018, episode 91, which I highly recommend listening to. Uh, On this episode, we chat about his sobriety, we chat about his life as an expat in Japan, daily routines, cultural differences, his newest round of poetry. He's a beautiful poet, just exceptional. And we catch up in life in general. I am a proud aunt of my nephew, Alex. He's accomplished so much. You know, it's it's really great and wonderful to see. So I'm excited to have him on the show. Check out Hey Human Podcast for links, Hey Human merch, and to learn more about my guests and the show. Check out SusanRuth.com to learn more about me and my other artistic endeavors. Uh, I'm making a film currently, writing... I wrote it, actually. I'm not writing it. I already wrote it. I'm directing it uh, in a couple weeks. Very excited. I can't wait to tell you more and to tell you where to watch it. (laughs) That'll be very exciting. Uh, You can follow me on social media at Susan Ruthism or Hey Human Podcast. Find my albums on Apple Music or wherever you get your music, Amazon, Spotify, all those places. My most recent album, All I Ever Wanted Was Everything, is available everywhere, along with four other records that I made. Uh, Check out my relationships and sex show, Are We There Yet?, with sexologist and healthcare practitioner Mara Edelman. That's on YouTube under Are We There Yet? podcast show. Rate, review, and subscribe to Hey Human on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. It's super helpful. It, It gets it up in the algorithms. It helps spread the word. So if you can, take a moment to rate and review. I really appreciate that. Okay, thanks for listening. Be well, be kind, be loving, take care of each other. Let's get into this. Here we go. Alex, Rob, can welcome to Hey Human. Thank you. I had to wait till I felt worthy of that name. I wasn't feeling quite human when I first woke up. but you know, uh, <laughs> And you are in Japan. I am in Tokyo right now, yeah. And it's early morning tomorrow. Yes, yeah. From me. Yeah, the future is bright. Don't worry. <laughs> good. That's good to know. <laughs> well, you were on the show a couple of years ago, and it's a great conversation that we had. You uh, and I talked about your addiction issues and that you were you were newly sober, relatively newly sober. And now it's it's been a little minute. How, how long have you been sober now? Yeah, I'm trying to remember what we, that was a long time ago. But um, see, the I stopped using like 2017 July or June 13th. So uh, I kind of stopped counting, but I guess it'll be like six years this year. Wow. Congratulations. Thank you. Yeah. Does it get any easier? Yeah. I mean, it's not really something I like think about on a day to day basis so much anymore. Um, you know, I kind of, there's some things I kind of miss about back then because, like, just like not using drugs felt like, you know, like on a day to day basis kind of felt like a, an accomplishment in and of itself. But now, like, to get that kind of sense of fulfillment, you have to start to find other things to do with your life. It's more ambiguous than just, you know, don't use drugs, you know. That was very easy to follow that rule set in some ways and very hard in others, but, you know, you knew what you had to do at least. And you were never really a big drinker or anything. No, I mean, like, I, it was never, like, my main thing but you know it was it was a good way to like you know make friends in college and stuff like that um social um, social lubricant as they say yeah it's more like a you don't really make real friends it's more like friends for that night or what have you um Mm -hmm. yeah that was never like my main my main deal how did you figure out 
what to make yourself busy with? Uh, a lot of trial and error and just, I mean, I guess you just kind of decide at some point you just gotta do something rather than nothing, even if it's not going to be your, you know, long-term goal. Um, I don't know. I guess, I guess I just always have had this kind of life philosophy of not trying to plan it out too far ahead. So like when I first got clean, I was like, okay, I got to focus on school. And then I got this opportunity to come to Japan and go to grad school. So that was my next thing. Um, and I don't know if it's like the best strategy, but like it kept things manageable rather than like trying to have this like, you know, perfectly planned, like grand design that I was trying to follow. Um, and it, you know, it keeps things surprising and interesting for myself. But sometimes it's, I look back and I'm like, wait, what? Am I actually going somewhere or am I just kind of like wandering around here and there and like, you know, dithering about? I think we all wonder that about ourselves. <laughs> what else could we be doing? Or did we make the right choices? Are we on the right path? I mean, there's a million different doorways to walk through. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's one of like the nice things about like having this like, history of you know addiction and then like getting clean is that you kind of have to let go of that pretty early because if you you know hold on to like the what ifs too much i think it could be a pretty overwhelming and i think for me like what i try to keep in mind is that like you know like the bad choices i've made and like my like tough times have definitely made me who I am just as much as like the good stuff and like if I didn't do all that make those mistakes in the past I'd probably be making some different mistakes in the future you know it's and who's to say what would have happened is your understanding of yourself now six some odd years later a lot different than the understanding you had of yourself when you first got clean I, I think so um I don't think so much because of like getting clean in particular, but just because no lot has happened in six years. Um, and I think at least for me, like I frame myself a lot in like, you know, whatever my latest challenge in my life is. Um, so like back then, like everything was very like, like, stopping using drugs and getting clean was like very much like the thing going on in my life so like i was much more defined by that and like now than like how i was dealing with that problem but you know you deal with different things as you keep getting older and uh each trial and you know and good things too like kind of reveal a different side of yourself and like show you a different thing that you might need to like work on or like figure out um and then sometimes you forget some of the old lessons and have to relearn them and yeah it's, yeah so has being in japan changed you yeah definitely um i don't know if this changed me some i guess this is part of me but i think it's changed my understanding of the world a lot more um not so much being in Japan, but just, uh, I think mostly like meeting a lot of other like international students, um, has really like made me aware of like what an American mindset is versus like the rest of the world and how different it can be. Like, I think I like, I talked to people in America about you know, what I'm doing, and they're like, oh, that sounds like, you know, you know, really crazy, and like, oh, yeah, like, you have to learn another language and all that stuff, but then there's, you know, I meet people from, like, Europe and stuff traveling here, and, like, this is, just, like, completely normal for, or, like, other countries in Asia, and, like, it's completely normal for them to, you know, go live in another country, and they speak, like, four or five languages, like, you know, very fluently, and, um, it just made me realize like how kind of self-centered we are in America. Sure. It is. It's a very uh, 
ethnocentric community, this country. Yeah. And I wonder if a part of that is because it's such a vast country. We don't even really, in some cases, know how to communicate with each other, let alone going to distant places. Yeah. 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 It's interesting, though, too. I mean, I guess this is like more of a thing for like people who are like born in America because, you know, of course, America has like a huge um, you know, immigrant population. Of course. I meant people born. Yeah. Just like, yeah. yeah. They speak, you know, two, three, four languages themselves. Um, so it's interesting, though, that like America both has this like kind of, you know, oftentimes it's very like self-centered uh, inward focusing view but it's also a country made up of you know many different cultures like living together at the same time um, it is weird considering how many different nationalities live within the united states but to mm -hmm. your point i think the ones that were born and raised here is just a different they have a different outlook yeah. and yet immigrants built the country run you know it runs on their ingenuity and their grit and their sweat yeah yeah i think um also like the fact that america doesn't really have like hom a homogenized culture like a lot of other places do um it's not old enough probably <laughs> yeah and you know it's made by all these different factions all coming together and trying yeah. to live together um but it and just the fact that, like, um, because of, like, you know, American, you know, like, media, like, imperialism all over the world, um, like, kind of like the default culture is, like, you know, American pop culture, um, versus a lot of other countries have, like, a lot more traditions and, like, kind of, like, cultural, like, uh, like, mindset and, uh, consciousness i guess um compared to us and uh, meeting these other people kind of makes you feel a little bit jealous of that sometimes um you know because i don't really feel like any particular allegiance or like identity with being american it's just kind of i feel like i'm just like the default which you know i'm sure like that's like probably not correct either but you know that's just kind of how you're raised to feel i think and in America. I don't know if that's still the case now, but certainly growing up for me and probably also for you, the expectation of pretty much every nation was to learn English and to understand what's going on in America and to have that be a part of their zeitgeist in parallel with their own, even if their own culture was thousands of years old. Yeah. <laughs> it is, it is a weird, it's weird. Do you experience any hostility at all as an american traveling um, not very like i don't think i've experienced any like overt hostility um in japan uh like japan has this kind of concept of like your outward facing face and your inward face so you it's very important to like you know be like polite to everybody essentially when you're out and about but i think that there are kind there's sometimes like the way that japanese people try and be polite to you can sometimes like it's not like a comes it doesn't come from a place of like contempt but maybe a place of like I don't know, it's just kind of weird. Like, for example, like, I will, I will be, like, go to a restaurant and I'll say, you know, a simple Japanese sentence, like, oh, I have a reservation for 6 p.m. And then they'll look at me and then in English they'll say, okay, your table is right over here, you know. Um, and I don't mind that so much because, you know, I'm still, like, I'm not, like, super fluent in Japanese. I'm still learning it. And, you know, I don't have, like, a lot of too much pride um, tied up in that. But, like, I have friends who have white skin and they speak you know very very fluent japanese and they'll still have the same experience and they'll reply in english but english isn't their first language either so it's like why 
you know, it's just, mm-hmm. it, it bugs them a lot more, I think. Um, it's kind of like the reverse of America where everyone, like if you go to America, you're expected to speak English because if you don't, you're kind of screwed because we don't speak anything besides English. Um, whereas Japan feels, has like a kind of history of isolation throughout their history. Um, and I think they're like shocked when anybody knows or can do anything in the Japanese culture. Um, like there's this kind of meme uh, online, like like among people who are trying to learn Japanese, or if you go there and you say like, Konnichiwa, they'll say, ah, Nihongo ga jōzu desu ne, which is just like, oh, your Japanese is so good. Like, no matter what you say, like, if you say, like, konnichiwa or, you know, ohayo gozaimasu, just any simple little phrase. Um, so it's like, a, like, it's hard to tell, like, when you're actually making strides and kind of, like, integrating into the culture, like, fitting in, or at least, you know, going with the flow a little bit more versus if they're just placating you and being nice to you because they're, you know, they are nice to everybody. It's like saying, bless your heart in the South. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. What made you decide to stay in Japan? Uh, a lot of things. Um, part of it was I felt like, you know, I, I came here with a plan of being here for two and a half years for my master's degree. Um, and two years of that was coronavirus, um, which I felt like was kind of giving me the short end of the stick a little bit. And like, you know, like my whole reason for coming here was I wanted to work on my Japanese and I could go to school for free. And I wanted to experience like living in another culture, like actually living there. Cause I feel like as a tourist, you don't, it's, you know, it's like the theme park version of visiting a country. Um, you don't get to know what it's really like. You don't get the experience of having to deal with like the local doctors or government offices or trying to figure out how to pay your health insurance or like getting to know your neighbors and you know all this other stuff that like is much more important, I think, to understanding what it's like to live in another country. Um, and I, I think I was kind of limited by some of that because of coronavirus. Um, there's that aspect. And then also, like, my original plan was I wanted to come back to America and do my PhD here. Um, but I've kind of realized that, like, the academia grind was one where you really had to care about your subject beyond anything else, essentially. And I really like math. I think it's fascinating. Um, I used to think it was like what I was like most passionate about, you know, like what I cared about the most. But I think it was more like back in the day, in the day, like in the undergrad and stuff. I was just good at it, and it feels good to be good at something. Um, and then as you move further along, you meet these people that are not only like just like naturally more talented at it, but are working much harder at it than you. And these are the people you're competing with. It doesn't feel good to be mediocre at something, I think, um, especially in a field where only like the like truly exceptional will get like the actually good jobs, you know, and then everyone else is relegated to like lecturing or, you know, all this other stuff. And, mm-hmm. and that plus, you know, I'm older than the average grad student. Um, and especially with math, there's a lot of, I think, I don't know if it's just prejudice or if it's just the truth, but it's kind of considered like you usually do your best like work, like your biggest contributions in math are from like your late 20s to like 40. Um, and I'd be in grad school till I was 35. And I I felt like I kind of missed the boat a little bit to, like, kind of really contribute to that. Um, And then thirdly, I just didn't want to leave, you know, like, I started to build a life here and I have friends and stuff, and I kind of wanted to stick around them. Um, 
So I decided to I'd stick it out for a while longer. Yeah. Yeah. And I follow some Americans in Japan TikToks. <laughs> see that there's a lot of uh, adjustments that get made in the beginning, and then you, you sort of get used to all of that. But what was some of the big ones for you? I think. Hmm. Food is a big one, I think. Like, like I love Japanese food, but the eating habits are, you know, still very different. Like, like breakfast is like usually like rice and, you know, fish or then some miso soup or something and kind of hard to adjust to that. Like, I don't, I don't do that for myself personally, but like if I have like a craving, like, you know, like a Denny's Grand Slam, that's like nowhere to be found essentially. <laughs> um, and just, uh, I like, like in America, you might not be able to get the best or most authentic version of anything, but you can get like anything you want because there's so many different cultures all at once. Um, so I miss the like kind of, abundance of choice over there um definitely like the language is a hard adjustment um i think until you know language very well it can be very isolating and lonely um or you find like a little pocket of other like foreigners to kind of just like isolate with um and another this okay, I don't know if this is a big one, but it's one that I've had some trouble with is that their garbage collection system is much more complicated than America's. Um, you have to like sort all your trash into like burnable trash, non burnable trash, plastic bottles, cans, bottle like glass bottles. Um, and each one has a different day you throw it out, and sometimes they only come like once every month, so you end up with like a house full of plastic bottles because you missed the plastic bottle day. Um, so just like very organized in a way that is hard to like get used to, I guess. Um, whereas for me, like, you know, back to my American apartment, I would just like oh, go to the garbage room and dump all the trash into the chute whenever I wanted to. Um, is your apartment small? It's small but it's so much bigger than my last apartment here that it feels huge to me now um it's like 300 square feet um but it's just me so plenty of space for that i think um when i first got here i was in a dorm room that was like nine square meters so i don't know what that is i remember how little that room was <laughs> yeah it was it's like I feel like it was barely bigger than the size of this couch, but that's mostly my memory of like yeah. how it felt being inside there. Your friends that you've made there, are they mostly from, not from Japan, correct? It's a mixture. Yeah, because I'd come to Japan, you know, a couple times before this. Like I did like a three month study abroad and I made some Japanese friends there at that time. Um, and I'm still friends with them now and see them, you know, regularly. And I made a lot of international friends at uh, Kyoto University because um, they have a huge program of international students. What's your favorite part of being there? Now that you've talked about some of the things that were hard to adjust to, what do you really love about Japan? Uh, it's a very, like, and it's kind of like this, like, like a contradiction where, like, there's a lot of, like, pain in the ass rules that you have to follow that are confusing at first if you're not from here. Um, but at the same time, once you get used to it, it's very well organized, like well engineered society, I feel. Um, and there's like so much like just cool stuff to like go see and do. And it's so easy to get there because of like you know, public transportation. Uh, generally like the streets are very like nice to walk on because they're super clean. Um, people are very friendly and helpful and generally like like care a lot about their you know their 
job and what have you um like service at restaurants is usually very good um and i don't know it's just like for me like i said earlier like back in america there is this you know it's just kind of like default pop culture like nothing distinctive about it to me but here like just even a normal street you know feels like this is kind of like japanese character to it which i really uh, enjoy you know because it's, it's new to me it's still novel to me even after like three years or whatever i've been here for um and kind of going back to the like well planned and organized like this the public transportation here is a nice surprise after living in like especially like duval <laughs> <laughs> like being able to take a train to you know the other side of the country if i want to on any day you know very easily and see some cool stuff over there you know it's like you can take a weekend trip with no problem um yeah your instagram you have the the pictures of the temples you've taken and the various sightseeing you've done the really really beautiful places yeah that was a lot easier when i was living in kyoto because there's just you know temples Temples were like Starbucks in Seattle. Um, <laughs> you could go anywhere and see a cool one. Um, yeah. Oh, and I just like living in you know, like Tokyo. It's just like this. You know, it's the biggest city in the world. You know, it's, it feels cool to be here. Like, at what kind of feels like the center of the world in some ways. Like, like it just makes you realize like how like America is huge, but it's very spread out, you know, um, and here it's like everything is concentrated in this one city. So it feels like anything is at your fingertips to some extent. I read that the Japanese businessmen, they they end up like renting little pods. because They get kind of toasted out with their friends after work and they just <laughs> sleep in the bushes and sleep in the... Is that true? Yeah. So that's another thing I like about Japan, actually, is that like, you know, it's a, it's a country that's safe enough where you can just be like so drunk that you just pass out on the sidewalk in the street. And it's totally, I mean, I don't know if saying it's totally fine is the right choice of words, but you know, it's safe. Like people do it and wake up and they have all their stuff and they just go on with their day. Um, so like in that sense, like there's like more of a sense of, uh, community i feel like um like this togetherness that people can interact outside and it's uh like the public spaces are more utilized here i think in some ways um, mm -hmm. like there's this uh shopping mall uh type building um in shibuya which is one of like the big one of the big like super metropolitan neighborhoods of tokyo um on the top they have this garden and every weekend it just like fills up with like young college kids that go there to like hit on each other essentially like they'll get like they'll grab their like convenience store beers and go and like all the boys will be in packs and like all the girls will be in packs and then like one of the boys will like try and go up to like one of the packs of girls and like shoot his shot and then either be successful or more likely come back to the boys with his head hung low and it's just I think really cool that like I don't know, it's just fun and interesting and how it feels alive to like see that kind of thing here. Whereas in America, we're much more confined to like our cars and houses and workspaces. You know, um, are there is there as much crime there in comparison, like for example, drugs or littering or uh, any kind of you know, here, just the other day up the street from me, about five blocks, two guys got in an argument, rammed each other with their cars and started shooting each other. <laughs> so insane. Yeah. So, I mean, I think like the stereotype is that like, oh, there's, well, especially among Japanese people, they like to say, oh, there's no crime in Japan. Um, and I think that gets overblown a little bit, but compared to the U.S., it's way, way safer. Um I think the biggest kind of like uh, the darker side of like Japanese society is that there is a lot of like um, like 
sexual harassment or assault related crimes. Like, um, I think there's a lot of, like, I just went, went on about saying how like people like come together a lot more in public spaces, but there's also a large segment of the population that's very isolated. Like there's this term, um, uh, hikikomori, which means like, you never leave your house essentially. And it's like these people that just like stay in the room all day and only go out like at midnight because you know they have for whatever reason they like just don't want to interact with society anymore so that's like the very extreme side but just in general there's this i think people get very isolated and they can and repressed maybe or like they suppress their true feelings a lot um which can then lead to like some weird behavior sometimes um like in japan there's this law that like all your your phones when you take a picture, it has to make like a shutter noise because people would be taking like upskirt photos on the train, I guess, and like they had to stop that. Um, so there is that aspect of it. Um, and I haven't witnessed any of that myself. You know, as a man, I'm probably not as aware of it. Um, but it definitely is something that happens. And, you know, to their credit, like, Japan doesn't really try and sweep it under the rug either. Like there's like we go to the train station. There's like posters that say like, oh, if you see somebody like groping somebody, then you know like say something. You know like you know call the police or whatever. Um, so they're, they're at least trying to be proactive about about it. I think, which is good. Mm -hmm. um, but as far as like violent crimes and stealing and all that stuff, like it happens, but it not anywhere like the u.s it's, it's very uncommon the yakuza isn't just walking down the street willy-nilly <laughs> only in certain neighborhoods but even even the yakuza are like i don't really know what how like much influence they even have nowadays but like they even they have like this kind of like sense like this code of like decorum like of who yeah. they'll mess with you know they're not like shaking down like random people on the street they're interested in running their like gambling and prostitution rings and stuff like that and they if you're not messing with that they don't care about you really yeah interesting when did you start getting more into poetry uh that's kind of been an off and on thing since i was in eighth grade um you're very good at it thanks yeah i mean i feel like it's Whenever, like, I'm always happy with my last poem, but then and whenever I look at a poem older than that, I'm like, <laughs> I had a really great uh, language arts teacher in eighth grade, and every Friday she had us turn in, like, a piece of writing, and it could be any kind of writing you wanted, just, you, you know, just to get students to kind of practice actually writing stuff. Um, and I started doing poetry partially because you had to write a lot less words to uh, fill a page. Um, but then I kind of became intrigued with the medium. Um, back then I didn't really have any like eloquent thoughts or like, well, you know, any big reasons why it's just like, oh, this is kind of fun. Um, but over time I kind of, I think the reason I like poetry is there's reasons why I like poetry that are like due to the strengths of poetry and reasons why that like I like it because you can avoid some of the other aspects of like writing stories, for example, um, that I don't want to deal with necessarily um, because it's just, you know, pure language you know like you don't have to tell a story with it you can but you don't have to um whereas like if you write a novel there's two sides of it that's like what story you're telling and how you're telling it yeah. do you want um, to read any of your poetry yeah i got one i wrote last week that i didn't post on instagram so that you could get the fresh scoop yay <laughs> there is stained glass in the hospital and bars over the windows doctors frantic and fraying i fantasized about dropped prescription pads and unattended allotted drips 
while I waited to hear my name. I hear everyone has a chart, and if yours says the wrong thing, they won't give you the good drugs or a new heart. You'll be doomed to hear, we'll be in touch after every interview, and I should go after every kiss. We'll refuse to listen to you, just smile and exclaim, oh, how tall you've gotten, as you melt into that old shadow. I would get so sick, I couldn't tell my dreams from my bedroom ceiling. My darling, there are no monsters here, we promise. But I had more faith in the constellations I'd see when I closed my eyes real tight. I'd stay like that till morning, afraid of seeing the truth, or afraid of realizing it wasn't up to me. It's beautiful. Do they just come to you or do you get an inspiration of a feeling, you know, like, um, like an emotional thing that needs to get out? I think it's kind of a combination of those two things. Um, usually it's like, I might have like a hint of a feeling. And if I'm lucky, I'll like write one line that kind of like unleashes the rest of everything and usually i'll like write the whole thing in like five minutes and then just put it away because if i mess with it more than that it's like you know you gotta just like let it be i think mm. and then maybe i'll like go back you know after a day or two when i tweak the line or two but i try not to change it up too much how are you feeling overall and where you are in life and and i know that you said that you're still trying to kind of figure out what you want to do and your place in the world but I mean, you seem like leap and bounds, even in six years, a different person. Yeah, I think overall, like, I'm, you know, I feel pretty happy with where I am. I think one thing I struggle with sometimes that, I mean, this is, might be kind of silly, but it's just like when you, like when I was, you know, in active addiction, in some ways, it was much simpler because you know you didn't have to worry or care about much beyond getting high, and like you know you kind of realize that like oh you're like you're not gonna go to grad school while you're an addict. You're not gonna like get some like high paying stressful job. You're not gonna clean your room or even you know it's just your life is very simple and easy. And, you know, it was painful and depressing, but it was manageable in, in a weird way at the same time. Um, but sometimes I'm just, like, struck nowadays by, like, how much work it is to be just a person, you know? <laughs> and, like, some days I just don't want to deal with it. I just want to, like, stay in bed and just not think sometimes it's just hard to find the energy to like be uh live up to the standards of what it means to be a human in society i think like going to work for eight hours a day and still you know keeping your apartment clean and doing your laundry and paying your bills and all that stuff and it's just you know nothing and no one thing is too much but it just for me like sometimes feels like it stacks on top of itself so much that just even taking out the trash can feel overwhelming all of a sudden um and you know i don't know if that's because i have some sort of like like adhd tendencies and so like executive functions are difficult for me or if it's just you know as part of being one of the things everyone has to deal with as an adult, but you know, just like learning just to like turn your brain off and sometimes just do the next task is something difficult. I, um, I think what you're describing sounds like being a human, but certainly most of the folks in our family <laughs> are neurodivergent to mm. some degree or, an, or another. Yeah. And I think, you know, just, when it's tiring and that's it, that's okay. But sometimes it can lead to like this kind of period of just like feeling like this general hopelessness, like it's just all too much, you know, and I have to do this for the next, like, you know, 35 years of my life. And like, it just feels like this huge overwhelming monolith. Um, 
that that's part of why I try not to plan too far ahead because it's a lot easier if you just think about like, oh, what what do I have to do this week versus you know what is my life plan and life goal? Yeah. How do you talk yourself back down when you do get too far on the edge? Well, sometimes that's where the poems come from. A lot of the times, like I think a lot of my poems have this kind of sense of like like powerlessness or like this feeling of like hopelessness to them um or loneliness and it's just like when i feel those feelings very strongly like i mean it's good because that's when i can write a poem you know like uh and it's also good because after i write that poem it kind of releases that feeling a little Mm -hmm. bit um yeah, there's an existentialness to your work that I, I read a lot as well. You've posted like you know several mm. on your Instagram that I've read and sent around to friends and mm. such, and everyone always is like, "Oh my God, that's yes, yes." You know, <laughs> it's good that you can speak the voice that, that sometimes we aren't even sure what the voice is. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what poetry is best at because, like, the power of poetry is like not what you say but like what you can kind of hint at with your with your words and like a lot of things you know it's like music like if you like explain why something is meaningful in a song or poem you know it kind of takes the power away um it's more it's stronger if you just allude to it and then like the reader kind of applies their own experiences to it um it's a conjuring yeah yeah exactly um and it's like it's like that feeling like you get it but you don't know what you get at the same time and that's i think that's the kind of thing that resonates the most yeah with me and sticks with me the most yeah you know i'm really proud of you you've you've just done I think you're an amazing human being. I've always thought that ever since you were little. I mean, I'm really proud of how far you've come. I mean, I was proud of you before Mm -hmm. the whole time. (laughs) It's a tough planet. And I understood every second of it being a tough planet. We all choose different ways to get through that toughness. But the fact that you were able to climb on top of that mountain and, and get over it is humongous. Yeah, thank you. Like, I'm, you know, it's, uh, I'm proud of that too. And it's something that, like, I always, you know, try not to, like, lose that sense of pride. But, you know, then I'm like, well, you know, the average person doesn't get super addicted to drugs. And, you know, like, we, no one says, like, we're proud of them. And I, I'm, I understand it's different, but it kind of inspires me more to, like, keep going. You know, like, I, I don't want to be satisfied with just, being clean you know Mm. like i want to it's a difficult balance between like being hungry and being content with what you have i think for sure but also understand that it may not look like heroin to some people some people's addiction something completely different could be shopping could be not eating could be lack of sleep could be running you know 20 miles a day whatever that is those are all ways to cope yeah we've put, we've put this idea about what it means to use drugs and alcohol as a coping mechanism but still a coping mechanism that's the bottom line yeah um there's it reminds me of this like david foster wallace quote i think i posted it on my facebook a while ago where it's like you know we paraphrasing it's like we all worship something but being adult is about like choosing what you worship um whether that's you know drugs you know your own personal beauty money or something you know more meaningful like you know loving your fellow human etc you know making that choice is like a lot of what i think finding meaning in life is about sometimes we grow out of our gods sometimes we grow out of our superheroes and there's this moment too where i think if you're lucky you eventually see yourself as as human and and flawed and that that is okay and not i'm human and flawed and it's terrible 
but I'm human and flawed and so is everyone else and we're all doing the best we can. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Tell people how they can find you. Uh, yeah. Poetry and stuff. Yeah. So I think the best way is through Instagram. Um, my handle is baby Rudin spelled R U D I N. How did so, that come to be by the way? I always wondered that. It's a uh, kind of an inside reference for math people. Um, there's this mathematician, Walter Rudin, and he w- wrote three books about uh, mathematical analysis. There's one for undergraduates called, that gets nicknamed Baby Rudin, and then one for graduate students that's uh, Papa Rudin, and then there's one for like like experts that's called Gran- Grandpa Rudin. So like a lot of times, like in your undergrad, like part of your, you know, curriculum is you have to go through baby rooted in one of your classes and do the problems. Ah, got it. I always wonder what that was. I wasn't sure if it was some sort of a, somebody had misspelled your last name. (laughs) That was what my old one was. I was uh, a Robskin for a while. uh, And that was just because like when I was in high school, once I got a hall pass to go to the office and they wrote my name Robskin and one of my friends just thought it was like the funniest thing ever and was just laughing for five minutes so I just that just (laughs) stuck with me for a long time oh man yeah it's for such a simple name people mess it up so easily I know right (laughs) yeah I'll say it all the time and they'll be like uh how do you spell that it's like how I want to hear how you think it's spelled because I'm curious, like what other options there are. Oh, people would be like R U B. They put V's in it, S's. It's, it's crazy. Finally, I just said it's like stealing from family, Rob, yeah, yeah. In, and they, even that doesn't do it. There's yeah. I just gave up. Yeah, yeah. Well, I love you. I think you're an amazing human being. Thank you for yeah. being on the show. I love you too. Thank you for uh, having me on it. It's it was a lot of fun. Yeah, it's, it's a good way to wake up you know, having some deep conversations <laughs> right out of bed. Yeah, we can do it again in six more years. <laughs> yeah, sounds good. I'll put it on my calendar. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. <laughs> Bye. 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 See ya. Rate, review, and subscribe to Hey Human Podcast on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks. Bye.